All right, welcome to another episode of the Doomer Optimism Podcast. My name is Donald. Uh, this is my first time hosting yet again, <laughs> and uh, I'm joined by Andy, Katora, and James, all of whom have appeared on the podcast before and even hosted an episode before, I think. Um, so I'm not going to introduce have. any of them because I assume that all of you have listened to all previous episodes and know um, know all about what's going on. Uh, it's the Feast of the Dormition of the Theotokos. And uh, it's a fine, uh, fine summer day. And <clears throat> I wanted to start off. Uh, we we're we haven't planned what we're going to talk about so i'm um that gives me an inordinate amount of power and i wanted to talk out begin by talking about uh old american stories that don't get uh talked about much anymore so we were briefly before we recording talking about natty bumpo natty bumpo the character of James Fenimore Cooper, uh, Deerslayer, Last of the Mohicans. Um, and so I wanted to hear what the three of you think about Natty Bumpo. <laughs> I just finished the Deerslayers. It, that's his the main character's actual name, right? Yeah, Natty Bumpo. He's good with... All the Bumpos are good with a rifle. Yeah. <laughs> Wait, so the Deerslayer I is... Is Natty Bumpo. Yeah, I think so. It's the first of the leather stocking tales, I think. Yeah. I have well, not read any of those books. Oh, it's okay. funny. I, I haven't either, even though I'm from what is officially known as the central leather stocking region of the state of New York. Uh, Natty, yeah. Bump, Natty Bumpo is a native son of where I'm from. And I, I'm familiar with him, but I've never read the book. Andy, my friend, this is actually kind of a Dio conversation. My friend Wes, who's uh, a great writer, uh, verging on the famous writer, his name is Wes and Zena. He writes a lot for uh, New York Times Magazine and stuff. Um, he's from up there, working class guy, Italian. Uh, and so he saw that you and I were talking on Twitter about country music, and he got really curious about you. Um, and so I'm going to have to introduce you guys. But he, the reason I'm talking about that is because he actually is very, very, very interested in sort of the Cooper history and the kind of like, um, the sort of like, I don't, what do you call it? The the kind of, there's a region that is shaped by James Fenimore Cooper. That There's a name for it, right? Is it the leather stocking? Is that what you just said? Uh, according to Albany, they they divide the state up in more in more or less arbitrary ways, as as distant rulers often do with their colonies, <laughs> have different touristic uh, uh -huh. locations. They say this is the central leather stocking region, and and nobody knows why the boundaries are what they are uh, in the yeah. signage. But yeah, that would be my region. I'm from the yeah. northern extreme end yeah. of it. Because you're you're actually from what a layperson would call the Adirondacks, right? Well, I I would I would I think for the purposes of this conversation, talking about quote unquote American stories, I would describe where I'm from as being the Black River Canal corridor, okay. because really you have uh, the the Adirondacks and the Tug Hill. And in the Mohawk Valley, I'm from the headwaters of the Mohawk River that flows down okay. to Cohoes by Albany and into the, yeah. the Hudson. And along the confluence of, of the tributaries of the um, Black River Canal is where they put the Black River Canal, which right. was an access point for commerce from logging in the western Adirondacks and yeah. the cheese trade and agriculture in the Black River Valley. Right. Uh, well, so, you know, so let's cut everyone out, including the listeners, and just do this for a minute. So my buddy is from Lake George, uh, which is, that's like properly the Adirondacks, right? Oh, certainly. I would call that the okay. Las Vegas of the Adirondacks. Okay. Um, and then <laughs> I lived for a year. I wrote Chosen Country um, in a, like a, kind of off-grid cabin thing uh in uh 
like between Kanjo and um, Sharon Springs. Really? So that's the, yeah. So that's the oh, Mohawk Valley. I'm, that's like the proper I'm Mohawk Valley, right? I'm yeah. heartened to hear somebody call it Kanjo because that's that's <laughs> local knowledge, man. Nobody knows it's it's for the listeners. It's properly Kanjahari, New York, and all the you know you meet the young people from can from from the town and and you say what school do you go to they say oh i go to i go to kanjo <laughs> <laughs> yeah it's yeah. really it's far more redneck than almost anywhere i've ever been in like the so james yeah. i have a question for you you wrote okay. a book about the american west why did you go to upstate new york to write it um it was free <laughs> I got no, James it. Fenimore I started... Cooper wrote the leather stocking tales. He wrote most of them in Europe. Well, I I I see where you're going with this conversation. Anyway, and I, I do anyway. wonder. Yeah. Well, I do wonder about the current. So, like, uh, for people who don't know and certainly won't care, even if they did know, uh, I'm in Eureka, California, right now. Um, I'm working on my second book, uh, which is about far northern California, and I've been living in a place called. Uh, Hyam Palm, which is um, a valley of 200 people an hour from anything. There's a gas station and a bar in Hyam Palm, but that's it. Like the school shut down, the community center shut down, the mill shut down. The gas station largely sells Bulgarian goods because there's a lot of Bulgarian, uh, I think it's fair on the podcast to say criminals uh, who live in the area. Um, but the valley is like 200 people. Everybody knows each other. Um, and I was like, oh, this will be perfect. Like I'll report my book and I'll see all this stuff. And you kind of lose touch. Like it's really hard to work on the thing when you're at the thing, you're inside of the thing you're writing about. Um, and so I've gotten not a ton of writing done, but I have seen a lot. There was big. The, do the Bulgarians have a church there? There's no, I mean, maybe privately. There's a lot of stuff going on back in the hills that you don't know about. I mean, but there's no there's no church of any kind in Hyam Palm. It's not big enough to support one. Um, and it's like 200 people in the whole valley. The town itself is like maybe 30, 50, something like that. They Sounds all like where I'm over. from. Yeah. Yeah, that's true. Um, yeah. We, that's pretty much all we have, too. Well, you've been here, you know. Yeah. It's like a gas station. And well, now the bar is shut down, but. <laughs> Oof. So it's interesting. The bar in High and Palm, this is a very Doomer Optimism thing. The bar in High and Palm is, it's really interesting because there's nowhere else to go, right? So, like, people will come and not drink and just hang out all night. Um, and, like, my girlfriend came to visit me, and there's this old guy, Stanley, who doesn't drink. And he was like, James, I have your fishing rods. I haven't seen you for two days. I, you want to have these fishing rods? And he gave me these old, like, fiberglass fly rods. And I had only been in town for two weeks at that point. And she was like, wait, what? Like, how do you, did you know that guy before? And I was like, no, I just met him. Like, but it's just that kind of feel. Like, as long as you're not a cop, like everything is fine. Um, yeah. Anyway, I've been talking a lot, so I'll let you guys go. But that's my status and my uh, view on where you can write from. I agree with that. I like to kind of be a little bit distant from whatever I'm writing to in the moment while I'm writing. Need a little bit of uh and they even say that a lot in general about your writing. Like if you're if you're gonna what write a YA, don't read any YA books. Whatever you're doing, you want to like separate yourself from that somewhat. Whether it's a different place or reading different sort of books while you're writing whatever you're writing. Yeah, I think Laura, what did you think of Deerslayer? Huh. Well, as I was reading it, I was like, this is a great book. I'm gonna make all my sons read it. And then I got to the ending and I was like, actually, maybe not. <laughs> Uh, Wait, I, spoil the end spoil the ending for us. Why why Well, throughout the main throughout the book, the the main female character like fell in love with the main character and by the end he was too daft to like realize that she liked him, so she just told him. And he didn't like her because he believed all these like unsavory rumors about her that throughout the book kind of made it out to be that they probably were not true about her, but then by the end maybe they had been true. But it didn't really matter because, like, she was a changed person, perhaps. But when he rejected her offer because of the rumors that he believed, she was forced to possibly go back into that lifestyle anyways, like prostitution. And um, I just found it, like, 
the entire book had been like the story of honor and the ending was only done that way in my opinion so that the author could use the main character in future books and it's easier to have your main character um untethered from a woman than it is to like oh now the second book is different right so I, well, that's, I, but that's kind of it's the same thing with james bond right like natty bumpo can't be like married happily at home like like farm and corn it doesn't work isn't yeah, that but, the metaphor? Isn't that the whole metaphor? Is that like in the Fenimore Cooper Irv, like if Natty mm -hmm. Bumpo settles down, that's like America settling down. That's the end of the frontier in the north. Like that's the whole. Isn't that like the metaphor? Well, it's more than just at? like it's more than just Fenimore Cooper. So I've been yeah. kind of mainlining Leslie Fiedler lately. So Leslie Fiedler, I think all of his books are now out of print somehow, which is a travesty because he wrote a lot of them. He was a literary critic who taught in Montana for most of his career. He was very interested in what he called the inadvertent American epic. But one of um, one of the Central American stories, which you get in the Leather Stocking Tales and you get in Huckleberry Finn, is the escape from a white woman, <laughs> who is the kind of the the image of home. And so you have, of course, Huckleberry Finn has to escape uh, the women who are trying to civilize him. And he gets on the raft with Jim. And then Natty Bumpo, you know, lives with the lives with the Indians. That's really um, good. And so this is one this is one pull of the inadvertent American epic. And then the other pull is, you know, Uncle Tom's Cabin. And uh, uh, gone with the wind, and so on, which is you know uh, the the first is escaping the hell of home to escape to the wilderness, and the other is home as as the paradise that has to be defended. Okay, Don, can I ask you something and fast forward us uh, fifty, sixty years? Yeah. Okay. Have you read the personal memoirs of Ulysses S. Grant? No. The greatest, the greatest memoir ever written in the English language. And he um, wrote it because he was broke. <laughs> well, hold on. So let me, can I just tell this story? Yeah, Because it is absolutely, if you don't, like, go read a biography of Grant. Everyone listening to this, it is the most intense, crazy American story that has ever, it's, it is the great American novel. Ulysses S. Grant is the great American novel. Um, yeah, yeah. But he was a thoroughly unremarkable boy from uh very near where i grew up a little farther from dawn but like close enough that my when i go back to visit my parents i drive out to grant's birthplace like all the time uh like on my solo trips because it's just like fun and it's 10 miles from the house um but he uh i think a lot of people know he was like a huge alcoholic uh and so he joins the army he goes to west point sort of by accident he's unremarkable at west point he goes actually weirdly to exactly where I was. He was at um he was at Fort uh, Eureka, I think, or Fort Holmberg, um, in the army. So he was out here on the on the Redwood Coast and he like fell in love with California, but he got kicked out of the army or he he resigned from the army because he showed up to like too many little camp meetings drunk and stuff. And eventually he lost everything. He like he had to get back around and across Panama by basically begging for spare change from other officers. He was so derelict. Um, and he got back, he sold firewood. He sold and chopped firewood in Galena, Illinois for like five years while his wife, this is why I was thinking of this, his wife, uh, she became this like intense civilizing influence. And so for the rest of his life, he would slip and drink, but he never drank around her um and she would always go around telling people like oh captain grant he's gonna do so many fun things someday and like completely believed in this complete failure like she was con she would tell people actively like he was gonna be president and he's a like getting spat at and kicked like on the streets of galena with his firewood and stuff and it's crazy and then of course like for many people the civil war saved him um and he has this like very, very specific ability to be really, really good at military logistics and long range planning, which everybody else was really bad at. Like they were good at different, like McClellan was really good at inspiring people and Johnston was really good at generalship and putting an army back together. And Grant was just like, okay, you know, it, and like Lee was really good tactically, but Grant was like, 
the long range strategies, we have to get that army out of that place. And like, I know how to do this. And he rises and rises and rises and becomes the most famous person after Lincoln is killed, like in the Western Hemisphere. Like, James, not, could I interject don't even... something yeah. quickly? Yeah. So part of the power of Fenimore Cooper, this is stealing a Fiedler line, is that name, his names that he uses have mythopoetic power. When you name mm-hmm. someone Natty Bumpo, mm-hmm. it's going to be a good book. Mm-hmm. And it's a terribly written book. He's not a great, like he's overwritten anyway. But it doesn't matter because you have someone named Natty Bumpo. And with Grant, there's also mythopoetic power. During the siege what? of Vicksburg, he goes on a multi-day bender. And where does he do it? Up the Yazoo River. Up the Yazoo. Up, Up the, the Yazoo. Yazoo. Up the Yazoo. Um, so, well, of course, well, so hold on, of course Grant is going to, has has mythopoetic power because he goes on a bender up the Yazoo River. Okay. Well, so the craziest, th- well, actually, this is, you, we skipped a very important point. He was born something like Hiram or something it started with an h i forgot what it was he was born with an embarrassing name that people always people his initial like birth initials were hug h-u-g um and because of an error with the congressman who wrote to west point to commend him because you have to get a congressman to sign off on you going to west point he put grant's uh mother's like his mother's maiden name in Grant's uh, forms at West Point. And Grant was so shy and retiring his entire life, which is why his wife was able to dominate him, which is oddly why he was able to become famous and successful because she was able to control his demons. He couldn't convince any of the like cool guys at West Point that his name was not Ulysses Simpson Grant. And so then when he comes down to history as U.S. Grant, have, bearing the initials of this new republic and also bearing the thing that would become his like kind of moniker where he refused at uh, Fort Donaldson to accept a surrender. He said, we'll only accept unconditional surrender. Um, And so he became unconditional surrender grant. And so the mythopoetic power is like, it's like truly like you have to kind of believe in something organizing the cosmos, like have that have worked in the way that And his name is Ulysses. I know, I know. Um, Okay. And so then he becomes president and He's president for a long time. We, 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 it doesn't matter. What is interesting and what I didn't know is that he leaves the presidency and he goes on a two year long world tour where he goes to China. 200,000 people throng the streets of Hong Kong, lighting firecrackers and following him and bowing. Um, he meets he has dinner with uh, Queen Victoria, who refuses to allow his son Jesse to join them. And he says, OK, we'll cancel the dinner. And then Queen Victoria relents. He was the most famous person on earth. Uh, And he then started the largest American banking house um, that became so large that when it was revealed as a fraud that he knew nothing about and he'd been swindled, he lost all of his money and it collapsed the American banking system. He went down, he went from being worth millions upon millions of dollars to being worth $20 five dollars uh and had to sell his house he gave his house to cornelius vanderbilt's uh son uh and as a penance because he had lost him so much money um and then he starts writing his memoirs which mark twain convinces him to like remove from the initial publisher and then take and Twain makes them the best selling memoir in American history, the best selling book in American history after the Bible. Um, they sell 300,000 copies in the first year. He gets immediately rich again and then dies like days after he finishes the book. Uh, and it's just like, that was the guy who lived in America. I do not understand how we produce these people. Um, sorry if that was a long thing, but I just, I've, I've been studying this dude and I was like, this can't be real. Like if you wrote this as a novel, like, no one would buy it. So, Andy, I want to hear from you in a second. But it's interesting, like James Fenimore Cooper, Ulysses S. Grant, uh, Mark Twain. People of uh, Mark Twain is still read, I think. But a lot of yes. these, Uncle Tom's Cabin, uh, Gone with the Wind, a lot of these stories which shaped America aren't read much anymore. Like Last of the Mohicans, there is not, Like there's the Penguin Classics edition is out of print. There's no standalone from Library of America. It's fascinating that, you know. um, So that we've lost touch with these stories. Um, 
which were so uh, central. And Couture, I, I muted you just because there was some background noise. So just unmute yourself whenever you want to talk. Um, so Andy, son of upstate New York, uh, what do you think? Well, I'm out of my depth whenever people start talking about literature. Um, I don't know a whole lot about it. Um, I, 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 I have a penchant for nonfiction. But don't you um, want to, uh, don't you aspire to be one of these characters yourself? You know, what's funny is, is, um, I think I, I, I really have no choice now, but to answer in the affirmative. Uh, but when I started out, I wasn't remotely self-aware. Uh, and, and I really mean that. And then, and then. It's sort of like what what James was saying about being able to write about something when you're in the thick of it, when you're right there, you don't even realize like it's hard for you to get an understanding of who you are, what your story is, or what the uh, the 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 metaphysical realities or the zeitgeist of the land that you're in really consists of. And so it wasn't until I joined the military and and stopped living the hobo's life that I started to get the idea of like, huh, well, I guess I've really sort of lived a, a, a uniquely American life in certain ways. Uh, and I've come to know this country and love this country in such a way that when I'm, when I'm with these military guys who say, oh, I joined because I love America and I want to serve America, I believe in a constitution. I say, it's sort of like when an old man talks to a very young guy, he says, oh, I love this girl, I love this girl. And, and the old man wisely says, well, tell me about her. What do you know about her? And the, and the boy can't really answer because he's just sort of swept up in his passion as a, as, a, as a youth. And sometimes I see these people, they say that they love America. I say, well, who is America? What does it mean to you? And they really don't have much to say um, that is substantive. And I realized that I did. And then all of a sudden I start telling my stories and I find that they're well received. Um, now it's now that I'm getting out of the military, it's a little like, uh, well, well, where where am I headed next? Now maybe I'm too self-aware to be the American hobo I once was. And maybe I'm too self-aware even to be a simple country yeoman in quite the way that I had uh, envisioned myself going. So I don't know. Um, but to me, reading novels about America, uh, it feels like it almost, to be honest, and this offends people who really love to read literature. It feels perverse to me to 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 gaze into these stories uh, like a like a like almost voyeuristically. Like here's the thing as it is, and I'm going to observe the thing, but it I also am the thing, so I'm looking at myself in this weird way where I'm just a little more like, well, why don't you just get out there and do it? Go and just be American, you know, go and have the dynamism of the 19th century. There is not forbidden. You can still live that way if you choose, you know. Um, I don't know if what I'm saying is remotely coherent, uh, but that's sort of how I think about these things. And I rustle a lot of feathers with my opinions about uh, fiction and, and America. But I, I, I don't know. I, I sort of feel like I, I've got two feet to stand on when I talk about it, I know that. Yeah, I think um, I noticed, like I used to want to write about riding trains, like, and I used to kind of beat myself up a lot about not, like how I hadn't done it. Like I really thought, you know, I've been a professional writer, like basically from the minute I stopped doing the kind of like traveler thing to some degree, you know? And uh, like, I realized later in now that I'm in my dotage, um, like I've realized that like I, it would have been really, really hard to do that. Cause I actually didn't, I didn't slow down. I would, I didn't slow down at 32. I wasn't riding trains, but I was still like really crazy and really, really mobile and really, really like I had no, I had not taken my foot off the gas at all. Like at 32, 33, it's only in the last couple of years that I've kind of done that. And it's only in the last couple of years that my, my writing about traveling has actually gotten good. Uh, and I think that has to do with like, I just didn't have the perspective on it. Cause I didn't, I think I could have, if I had like left that thing and gotten a career, like a normie career at 25, I'm sure I could have written a good thing about writing trains at that, back then. Cause I would have had distance from it in space. But now 
I realized like I, it, it's only now that I've gotten enough distance. Maybe you, despite being younger, the military like gave you a perspective on it that I didn't have. I don't know. Don, did you ever ride trains? I forget. No, I never rode a train. I did a bunch of hitchhiking, but I never rode a train. Yeah. You still can. Uh, no, nah, that's all right. <laughs> I want to ride trains. That's that's. I need to do it. <laughs> I feel like Andy. I feel like Andy could make that happen. That's that's yeah, the goal. I, I think it's gonna. I think I could. <laughs> I wonder. I wonder what your dad would think about Andy making that happen. Uh, he doesn't have to know until afterwards, and then. <laughs> uh huh. Uh huh. Uh -huh. Yeah. So you know, well, Andy. I, I won't I guess, tell him. Uh, Good. I think self awareness is not. I don't. Know, I think self awareness is not necessarily a a problem or a bad thing, you know. Um, but uh, I think that the literature has always been part of the Amer American life and American story. And in fact, it was way more a part in the past than it is now. So, to give one example, in my little city in Northwest Washington. We have a statue of Mark Twain. Why do we have a statue of Mark Twain? Because he came here once for one night. Mark right. Twain came here once for one night and gave a speech or a reading or something to which probably everyone in the city came. And then he left the next day, and never returned again. And we still have a <laughs> statue of him. Awesome. Uh, and... There's a town in... Um... There's a town in the Sierra Nevada, uh, just sort of up the hill from Sonora, uh, that's called Twain Hart because both Mark Twain and Bret Hart uh, like passed through there. I don't even think they lived there. Um, and I would, it's the same kind of vibe. It's that. But anyway, go on. Sorry. So anyway, I think like that actually this literature and these stories were really part of us in a way that they are much they still are to some degree but much less so because fewer people are telling them and reading them and um and a lot of the life and pleasure of the stories has been wrung out of them by high school english teachers and english professors who somehow find a way to make you know writers like uh dickens and shakespeare and mark twain boring which on its face seems impossible if you read those books with a like a clean an open heart and a clean head, but they somehow find a way. So uh, anyway, I think you know that 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 sort of old American spirit was imbued with these stories, and that like that they're not a kind of outside alien force imposing self consciousness that that slows people down. I think that sort of the opposite actually that as we've become less connected to these stories um you know they've been it's it's taken something away from us there's there's a lot to there's a lot to say here there's a lot to reply to here um and the one the one thing that I'll say is that I think a central question of this era is it or really i guess it's a two-headed thing well when we're thinking about america in the present era we're th we have to think about two things if we're concerned about culture and the 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 reproduction of culture or the uh the steering of the of the zeitgeist right and and we have to think about decline i i do think that we have to think about the decline of western civilization uh, you know, like if you've ever read Oswald Spengler, right? There's just some kind of heavy thing where you're looking around, and you're like, huh, things ain't what they used to be. And then kind of uh, adjacent to that, we have to think about authenticity. And there's a lot, I think uh, Charles Taylor wrote a lot about authenticity that I read a number of years ago. And all I ever took from anything I read about authenticity is, or anything I ever thought about authenticity is that when you have a secondary option uh, to, to the path that you're on, your authenticity is in jeopardy, right? Like the, the, uh, the, the poor cracker sod house farmer in, you know, uh, uh, Missouri or Kansas, right? 
1855. They, they put themselves in a situation so intense. There was no backup. There was no getting an Uber to Kansas City and going out, you know, for a burrito. There was they were doing what they were doing and they were able to make so many stories about life on the prairie that then later almost secondhand percolated into the zeitgeist to the point where where a businessman who lives in Boston might be reflecting on the on the stories of the old west as he goes and makes a business deal or makes his way into his office. And this gets him through the day. It makes him American somehow. He conducts himself in a different way, even though he never was in the position of saying, I live in a sod house on the prairie and I have no other option. Right. So there's this multi tiered uh, uh, way that myth is spun. And there are those who are living the myths. And then there are those who are consuming them secondhand. And they kind of feed one another, if that makes sense. Um, so I don't know. I, I, I guess I think at the end of the day, the people who are going to be poised to really make stories that captivate the hearts of nations, they're going to be living a life that they really just had no other choice but to live. I mean, why is why is popular culture obsessed with the ghetto? They love the ghetto. They love the wire. They love rap music. They think it's great because there's a desperation there from that is issuing from the ghetto that that captivates people. It's the same with the the stories of the old west and the prairie and things like that and so today who among us in the hyper affluence that we live in is really backed into a corner and says i i can't do anything but what i'm doing now it's going to be completely internal you know uh like like does that make sense so katora i want to hear from you and then i i have a thought on that as well yeah um i don't know i obviously like literature from it's kind of obvious, <laughs> but um, I read a lot of it. I definitely get where Andy's coming from. And like, I've noticed that a lot in my own travels and such, like it's made me more aware of like looking, like the more I've traveled, the more I've like looked back in my life and I've been like, ooh, I have like a lot I could write about. And I have written a lot about it. A lot of it I haven't published and probably never will, like my memoir and such. But um, uh, specifically with fiction though, um, I had a thought and now I'm not sure I'm going to be able to actually get it out correctly, but there's, I don't know. I just love fiction so much. And I think it does make us more aware and help us be able to appreciate for some of us, it can help us appreciate what we had versus what we might've had. Um, I think different sorts of fiction do different things for different people. For me, it's made me more appreciative. I have lost a little bit of that through fiction for sure like I'm not able to live with the same sort of like carefreeness that I was as a teenager I also am happier than I was as a teenager though <laughs> so like there's a little bit of both happening there but um in general though I would I'm cautious when I recommend other people to become readers because just being a reader in and of itself reading fiction in general and specifically I mean isn't enough because like there's all sorts of stuff out there, especially like I was talking to Andy about this like a little while ago, like required reading in school. I would completely take the required reading list out of school and replace that with the books that I think are better just because like I, I don't like most of those classics and most of those pieces of literature. I, I think that they're doing the exact opposite of what literature is meant to do. They aren't building up hope in humanity. Uh, the most of the books that you have in high school that that are literature wise, um, literary are uh like lord of the flies and um 1984 all those books they just make they just make humanity look so evil and so horrible but then you have other books such as crime and punishment or obscure classics that aren't even like or like green dolphin street just like these other beautiful books that aren't necessarily classical but are still beautiful pieces of literature and fiction that can still bring out our awareness, but not this sort of bitter, cynical view on humanity and can still help us like understand and live better and do. I guess it's like that, that fine balance. Like if literature isn't helping you live a better life, but it's only helping you escape reality, then it really isn't doing the job that it was that the author meant to do. And the author is just meaning to give you, depending on the author, of course. But I feel like people who write beautiful pieces of literature are are proposing to you that this is how life can be if you wish it to be it doesn't have to be this horrible horrible thing 
I don't know. That's that's just my take on reading. I think it should be a happy thing that also enriches our everyday living. And beauty is not superfluous. Yeah. Uh, so Andy, I, you know, I I read to my older daughter Laura Ingalls Wilder a lot. Another like a great American storyteller, and you know, I actually think that the move west was a conscious choice. Like Almanza Wilder leaves a prosperous family farm in New York to try his, you know, uh, to try to make it out West, that the Americans who are heading West are leaving much easier situations often, not always, uh, to try their hand at something incredibly difficult. Um, they're hearing stories about it. They're telling stories. I don't know. I don't think it's the back. Once they get out there, their back is kind of against the wall. Not, you know, a lot of them abandon their homesteads and go back east or, you know what I mean? It's like a, it's, um, I think there was a lot of choice involved. Um, a lot of choice. And that's what makes it interesting. I and, was going to argue that too. I think like, if you, if you think of like the most desperate you know, like a Mormon settler in a little, you know, half cave on the Wasatch Front. Like, they're leaving Copenhagen and London and stuff to go do that, like, by choice. Like, that's part of what's so crazy about it. That's part of what I, I identify never, with it. Um, I would never deny that they had agency in the decision to go west, um, at least in some sense. I think what I what I'm really what I was really trying to say is that when you're in that you're you're you can't there's no there's no way to just get out of it like even just to get out of that situation if you're on the wasatch how long does it take how much effort does it take you might die on the way back right and you know well, this. So i'm with you the reason the reason i think it's kind of an important point is that like i think the kind of i mean those of us who exist in some of the spheres of conversation that a lot of us do exist in like you spend half your freaking life dealing with people being like oh that guy's a larper oh that's fake oh that's fake oh that's fake and like i think it's a really significant point like that i think probably andy you'd identify with like i mean look at like katora's dad he's like one of the realest dudes on earth like he doesn't have to live the way he does like but after a while like if, or if you're riding trains or something like you don't have you can take the freaking greyhound you can beg change and take the greyhound you have the option but after a while it becomes reality and reality is very difficult to escape whatever the reality is and like if you chose a thing because it does matter to you like which that's kind of why i give the mormon the mormon thing like it's a choice like you did not have to leave copenhagen and come to the banks of the great salt lake like it's an insane thing to have done but once you've done it you're in it that's your reality and you're doing it because you believe in that thing like I kind of don't, I don't, I hate this thing online of people getting mad. Like, oh, that's, he's not a real homesteader because he did X. And it's like, yes, he is. Like, I'm sorry. He's whatever he's doing. I don't care if he's tweeting about it. Like he's still more real than you because you're giving him shit about it. Like, so that right. just by definition, shut up. Like, cause you don't know anything about his life and you've chosen to like, and I, I think that it becomes this really important point about authenticity in the american experience because now to quote unquote live an authentic life people are like yo you could just have a flat screen tv we live in material abundance and thus can you delegitimize any political project thus can you delegitimize anything that anybody wants to do uh and i think that that's a kind of weird like rhetorical crisis that we've ended up in and i think it like it hurts our literature it hurts our filmmaking and we don't our political conversation it's a misunderstanding of who we are also because mm -hmm. what is the first act of american the 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 central like poetic act of american independence it was a bunch of boys dressing up as indians <laughs> and throwing tea in the harbor right it wasn't the declaration of independence but the 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 act that we still remember as and and I think it's amazing that in that act it was a bunch of boys playing Indians. Mm -hmm. That that part gets elided sometimes, but that the that 
that America is always, <clears throat> you know, that that um, that kind of play acting uh, is there from the very beginning. And, it, you know, is, that, is it play acting, Don, or was it cultural appropriation? <laughs> Well, it's you know we talk, we talk about the disappearance of the frontier. This is and I I don't think this is an original idea, but something is you know I don't think the frontier was a physical place. I think that still exists. Actually, there's still a lot of really rough uh, country out there that you can go to where there's nobody and you can make a hard scrabble life if you want to. I think the disappearance of the frontier in the American imagination was actually the disappearance of independent. Indians who uh, acted uh, oftentimes went to war uh, sometimes often successfully and that the 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 Indian was um, like the personification of the American frontier which pushed west and west and west and then you know um, so anyway that's an idea that I've been thinking about lately and it's interesting I don't that, think that that's part complete, of the American though. story doesn't get told anymore at all. I, there's, you're missing one component of what the frontier was, though, which is that uh, we had a hyperabundance of game. And so now, where, wherever you go now, because people always say this, and it's a misnomer. Like, they're like, oh, you can go to wherever you want. And you, why don't you just start a cabin in Montana? Well, the reason people could do that in 1848 and the reason you could be a trapper and live through a winter nine months without seeing another soul, you just brought coffee and tobacco and a gun was because we had tons and tons and tons of animals roaming around and you could kill them and eat them. And it was really easy to do that. And there was a hyperabundance of fish. If you lived on a salmon river, you could smoke your meat and store that for, I mean, this the river that I'm on right now used to have millions of fish. Now it has 20,000. So like a person looking at that salmon run of 20,000 would be really confused about how to survive a winter. It was not confusing back then. And so everyone had the option of disassociating from society. That option has been closed and it's a product of caloric values. Like we just don't, there's not enough calories on the land that you can go take anymore. Um, and we've kind of missed that stuff now. Um, anyway, sorry. That's Outside of right. Alaska or some parts of Alaska. Yeah, sure, sure. I mean, there's some place, but like even there, even there, like think about a salmon run that sustained populations of 5,000 people or whatever. The salmon run is much, much smaller and the population of Anchorage is 60 times greater, right? Um, go ahead, yeah, sorry. I'll, I'll provide, if I may, a contrasting view to how you guys are conceiving of frontier, which is that the, I would almost submit that the, the granular physical aspects of what a frontier or how, how a frontier could be defined are almost totally insignificant uh, because there's a there's a metaphysical frontier if I if I could say that that if you zoom out away from just America in the frontier era from I, what I guess the, the the 16th century to the to the early 20th at best um, Zoom out and look at the history of Western culture. Look at the history of, of, of Northern Europeans and the diaspora. In Northern Europe, prior to the New World, there was a restlessness among different populations. And, and there, there were the vagrancy laws in, in Britain, the enclosures in Britain, uh, you know, Hadrian's Wall and, and, the, and the, the culture of the borderers in the British Isles and and different conquests and, and all this riotous business that was always going on between tribes in Northern Europe for thousands of years. It, there was always a tension like Cain and Abel between the, the people who could kind of say, look, let's just relax and get, get settled up. We'll build things out of stone. We'll sit right here and we'll pray and we'll do our thing. Uh, please don't come kill us. And then there was the other group of people who no matter what they ever got, by conquest or by right of of, of land or, or whatever opportunities, they just could never stop moving around. And then they came into the new world, they continued to move around. And now the, the physical granular aspects of saying, oh, well, there's so many beavers in the swamp, there's so many salmon in the river. Yeah, that you're right, James, that is gone. But that 
almost uh, metaphysically deterministic uh, blood memory. And and James, you heard me talk about this before on on the other podcast. It's still alive in us. So now maybe you can't go into the wilderness, but there are other frontiers. Um, the same way that there's there's frontiers, you could be in solitary confinement in prison, and you could have a, fr- a frontier mindset, or you could not. It doesn't matter what's physically around you. It's a it's a psychological or spiritual state that people are in, and there will always be tension between these two almost nations of people who are who are co- they, they they congeal in in one way and are sedentary, and then the people who are just they're wandering. They're 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 vagabonds of the spirit as a people, and it's through their blood that that impulse travels. You know. So can I can I push back on that slightly? And we're we're now a little bit recapping a conversation that we had on a different podcast. Everyone go listen to Voice of Gord, uh, where we did this for hours before. Um, but like I think we talked about on there, right? Like James C. Scott and like the idea of like. Like, I don't know, my thing, and this is just, I mean, this is just a catch line, but like America legalized barbarianism. Like that was what the cool thing the American nation did. It's like you were a peasant somewhere, you had a lord, and in medieval France, it was really hard to get away from that guy. There was another guy who was going to tell you, you have to do this. And America legalized you, that thing of fleeing the civilized, the Cain and Abel structure, you flee the sedentary life and you go to the mountains. We made that legal. We were just like, oh, you're a regular person. You want to come here? You can be a barbarian. It's cool. And they're just like, keep running from us, keep going west, you got this for a while. And so I agree with everything you're saying about frontier of the mind and all that stuff. And interestingly, American, like American elites have tried to capture this, right? There's like a Nelson Rockefeller quote that's like, we have to get them boys that would have gone to the frontier back in the day to go into finance and look for new markets. Like that has to be their frontier. It's a great quote. I want to put it, I want to, I cannot wait to deploy it someday in writing. Uh, but they 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 know this stuff right they tried it with space they tried it with finance they try it with tech right like it's all this stuff they know exactly that there is this restlessness um but what is not present i would say is like the collectiveness of that when you remove the ability to like fit your physical displacement can be a collective project with other people to go with you and yourself like to feed your family and create a new life and that can be a collective national project, that aspect of the frontier did end. So it's not like your frontier and the ended, but our frontier as a people, like they, they, that door did close. And I think we're still suffering from that. I actually, my basic theory of like why America is going to probably not work out is like our national story needed that thing. We were the barbarian nation. We were the wandering people and the door slammed shut and everybody's standing around in the room going, wait, what? Like, where do we go now? Um, and I don't, I, until we come up with an answer for that, I think we're doomed, basically. Uh, that's my doomer side of the doomer optimism cultural gab fest. Um, I feel like I have a little bit of an answer to that, but at least I'm small skill. And I feel like, um, basically, it seems like we're just all asking the same question right now, um, like what we think the American the American lifestyle is, and if it's still like possible, I really like what you say though about how America legalized barbarians, barbarianism, and that's why I find it so immensely offensive when people are like throwing Romans thirteen in my face all the time. I'm like, you must do this because this is legal, and like, and this is America, guys, and Caesar doesn't live here, <laughs> kind of thing. <laughs> we left that behind us when we came over on those ships, <laughs> but um. Yeah, I I feel like we need to reclaim the idea that appropriation is a good thing and it's it's inherently American to to take what we want and to use it to build good communities. Um not not for selfish means. A lot of people will use use anything to like and that's part of why I feel like America is crumbling is because it's become very identity individual focus and focus on one's identity and what one wants to become oneself. But like, if we like go away from that and like reclaim these different things, such as like appropriation and like appropriating certain traditions and certain skills and using them in a way to build wholesome, real everyday community that isn't fake and isn't LARPing because we have decided it isn't fake and it isn't LARPing. It has become a part of our actual life, even if it wasn't our actual life, like we're doing it in this very aware state of mind that might kind of start out fake, but a lot of good things start out kind of feeling a little bit fake. 
whether it's like converting to Christianity for some people at first, like sometimes you kind of go through the rituals until those rituals become like very real to you. And that's how hospitality starts. And that's how like building community starts. And that's like, if you have an idea about America at first, it's going to feel kind of fake because you're like, oh, I'm reclaiming these things that aren't really me and my tradition, but they can become you and your tradition. Um, like my family has done to some extent, like a lot of what we do is also just kind of like how we were raised because my great grandpa decided not to get a social security number. So that set us, uh, set us up for success. But also like my dad did other things. Like he, he, he wasn't raised to look Amish. He he's taken on a lot of like appropriated a lot of Amish type things for his own family to give us a sort of like appearance that he wanted to give us a sort of lifestyle that he thought would be better for us. You know, I don't know. Like if that makes sense. I really like that. Um, I just wanted to chime in and say I, I like that take, and I think that's sort of you just said. I think what this conversation is sort of driving toward, because um, like I think it was like going back to how Don started. Um, like maybe unlike Andy, I don't care about Western civilization that much. I do care about American civilization, and I think like that we kind of lose track of how much. My explanation for why these books are not read as much anymore is that they were nation building books as much as they were literature. And like it was a pro part of a project of building an American self conception that now, like people don't have to read Cooper to understand what it is to be American anymore. I don't think that was true when Cooper was writing as much. And I think people, you will hear people describing this all the time when they read Hawthorne, Melville, maybe to a lesser extent. Like all of this stuff was like, wait, 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 oh, this is who we are? Okay, hold on. Like, and I think now that people are less invested in the national project, we don't have that core desire to get that out of the literature. Um, but we need to. So no, no, I agree. Wait, well, okay, um, without... I want to ask I want to ask Katora right. something really quick. Yeah, please. Which is speaking of old American stories, is your dad related to the John Lamb who was the revolutionary? <laughs> Like the American Revolutionary? Oh, I don't know. I know that we have, we're, we're directly descended from some lamb that came off of the ship that came with the Mayflower. I, okay. But, uh, if that somehow ties into the revolutionary, John Lamb. Like one of the, I, I'm fairly, one of the most radical American revolutionaries was uh, named John Lamb. Like your uh, name. Uh, and, We're also related to Jesse James. Well, Jesse James' brother, Frank James. That's, that's it. Yeah. Um, okay, sorry, Don. Go on. Uh, well, I was going to say, when we lose Cooper, we lose the stories of the French-American, uh, French and Indian War. Because that those are the popular stories of that. Um, I guess the last of the Mohicans is that's the French and Indian War. And when we lose the French and Indian War, then George Washington, we lose George Washington too. That 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 that's the war that made George Washington George Washington. And so it's interesting. Can I, can, when you can start... I, can I interrupt? Because I think people don't know this, like this story. Washington was sent by the colonial government of Virginia to Don and Mai's homeland, the Ohio Valley, to try to drive the French away before they could finish a fort at what is now Pittsburgh, Fort Duquesne. Um, and he was real, he was 24, had never had any combat experience and was training people who were raised by the colony of Virginia. They were not British regulars. Uh, and he was not good at it. And he, his first engagement, uh, he described as a victory over a French emissary. The French sent a guy basically down that was like, hey, don't keep coming up here. Like, we're gonna kill you if you do this. And they stumbled upon them. And Washington, they fired upon the French, killed a few of them, and then Washington's lone Iroquois ally came and murdered the French emissary, um, and then they killed all the other guys, uh, or a lot of them. Um, and then the next engagement, the French sent some dudes to go whack Washington. This is all while Britain and France are not technically at war. They sent like 300 dudes to go whack Washington, and Washington was like on his way up to try to attack Fort Duquesne, which was an insane thing to do. Um, and they absolutely decimated him, drove him back into this little stockade that he had built at the bottom of a marshy plain while the French and Indian 
regulars like all sort of like took up positions in the valley like shooting down into him during a rainstorm so all of their powder was wet and they couldn't shoot back um and then washington went back with his survivors to the colonial government of virginia and they were like well unfortunately there is no one else except this 24 year old who will go off into the frontier and do this so can you recoup and head back out there and washington was like all right and that was our first president um so anyway but in the story people don't realize like his role in that thing like he basically started that war and and he he's remembered as a hero Mm -hmm. um like in fenimore cooper's telling of the washington story he rescues the british which may happen later. I'm just it, yeah. But just in funny, any like, case, the, yeah, the, yeah, yeah. the point is that when you lose the story of the Fre- uh, French and Indian War, you lose the the story of Washington, of how he became Washington. So in any case, I think. Um, and uh, and those stories of Washington. Were there, I mean, the you know there's the the he's depicted in washington dc ascent it's you know ascending to heaven that's like the apotheosis of washington he's a kind of like a like mythic religious figure in american imagination but in losing the french and indian war stories his like the founding myth of the myth of washington is cut off and and um the founding of america becomes sort of senseless in a way of like why who he is and what figure he is and at this point i guess the main story told about him is that he's a slave owner he was a slave owner yeah or the kind of the saw of like the cincinnati myth i think that we we still have that the, the kind of like he was the one person he could have been emperor and he's the you know one of the only people in the history of the world to have turned it down you know um, I think I think we retain a kind of reverence for that decision, uh, even today. Like in our, my parents used to tell me that all the time. That was definitely yeah. A, I think I think we retain American. that. I think I think I think kids going to school are still like, oh wow, he did that. But maybe I'm wrong. Yeah, I think so. I was home. I think we for- <laughs> we forget. Uh, I, I- <laughs> I was raised okay. by a by a, an avowed loyalist who would always talk about how great King George the Third was. So I I really have no idea. <laughs> <laughs> you know, it, I'm curious if you guys have read, uh, and I have not. I've read a, I I like uh, Francis Parkman a lot, the sort of early American historian who, at 24, did the Oregon Trail for fun, um, <laughs> and had a great quote. A great quote that was like, all men of real virility love danger and uh, discomfort. And so why not do this trail or something? Like it starts with like a really like funny, like kind of like, I don't know, masculinist is maybe the wrong word, but it's a very very tough quote. Uh, But he wrote his great life work, which no one I don't think cares about now, was he called the Forest Trilogy. And it was the history of French North America. Um, and I'm really, really excited to read it. Which he and, wrote while being effectively blind. Yeah, right. Um, oh, he's a, Parkman. Parkman is a Powell? tragically forgotten. No, Francis Holy. Parkman. Oh, Park. Okay. Yeah. Um, but I, I mentioned this because, like, the the name is evocative. Mm-hmm. Like, when we lose the French and Indian War, we lose also the kind of like natural history grounding that like made this continent worth fighting over, especially the Eastern continent. Like we have a good sense of like, oh, there's a lot of gold out in California, but like the forest wealth of this like semi-trammeled melange of French, Indian, British, maybe American colonial thing, like moving under this canopy of trees, like that just existed for hundreds of miles like we lose the substance of that thing and like what it was valuable for and like what this like birth was because by the time you get to the revolutionary war it's a transatlantic war essentially um and it's not it, it's a war that was won by maritime action literally like it, it ends with maritime action but the interior war was the french and indian one and that's the one where you learn about how nature shapes society and i think we've completely forgotten the history of that war 
It's also important <laughs> because Ohio plays a central role. Yeah, it's a war over Ohio. <laughs> um, and Ohio is the imagine. greatest state. And so uh, I think, you know, James and I have unintentionally and subtly steered this entire conversation around Ohio subjects. Ulysses S. Grant, the That's French name. So uh, I have oh, a, I I don't know if anyone's written this history, but this idea that Ohio in the time between uh, the Civil War and I don't know, maybe Woodrow Wilson or FDR. That chunk of time, Ohio ruled America. That is, yeah. And so that you have the true. series of Ohio presidents. Uh, and then oh, Ohio Don, and that's a million dollar book. Like the age of Ohio. The age of Ohio. That so Ohio, a, Ohio a ruled Noble America. Bestseller. Yeah. And then FDR is this like resting of America back by yeah. the Northeast establishment, uh, socialist establishment or whatever. But that you have this glorious t- time of the Ohio regime, uh, you know. Don, write that. Well, that you'll, you'll be Ron Turn like that's a Ron Chernow bestseller, top of the Amazon history chart. That's a book dying. The Age of Ohio. Yeah. Oof. Um, well, I, is- I um, connecting this too to Ohio, uh, the French and Indian War. I always because I I really really atta- attached to Quebecois culture and I like speak Quebecois French and I Quebec is like a really really as much as I love it like it's really hard to become Quebecois like everybody's like oh they, you're a curiosity you're not one of us uh and it's it's just a very it's not a culture that welcomes outsiders I'm sure there are Quebecois people who are listening who are going to say that I'm wrong I'm no you are wrong you do not see yourself it is a very isolated non-welcoming culture uh I love it nonetheless um but interestingly in the era between the French and Indian War and the breakout of the American Revolution, part of what caused the American Revolution was the Quebec Act, which put Ohio under the jurisdiction of Quebec, um, which everybody hated. Uh, and you couldn't go and settle in Ohio. And so a lot of the kind of populist ferment was about uh, kind of wanting to reverse that act. Uh, and But it also means in my brain that Technically, I kind of am Quebecois because Ohio, until the Revolutionary War, was Quebec, um, <laughs> at least in name. <laughs> <laughs> Do you know Conrad Richter? Any of you? Yeah, I haven't read any of his stuff, but I I have some of his books. So he wrote about the settling of Ohio. Uh, that's pretty cool stuff. But it's really kind of like people would get in wagons and they'd go out to Ohio and they're like, oh, I guess we'll stop here <laughs> and start <laughs> felling trees. It seems as good a place as any. In his novel, The Trees, it's great. The family's out there and they're kind of wild, you know. And the, mm-hmm. finally, the guy's family's like, hey, we should probably put a roof on the house. Because <laughs> they're just, <laughs> you know, they're just. You know, he's like hunting and felling trees and stuff. And he's like, oh, yeah, I guess we will put a roof on. Uh, It's funny because whenever I think about Ohio now, I think about years ago, I I wound up in uh, Chicago for my 21st birthday. And on the drive out to Chicago, there was what? um, I'm driving on the road uh, with, with all these people. And we're looking out the window going down I-90. And somebody said, oh, my goodness, is it a full moon? And I looked out. I said, I don't think it's a full moon, but maybe it is. And then we're looking and looking and say, wow, look at that big moon, real low on the horizon. Then we get close to it. And it's a big Burger King. It's a glowing king, glowing Burger King sign and way high up in the air, you know. And so that's that's where Ohio is now. It's, it's the moon over Ohio. It's the Burger King, you know? <laughs> well, or, yes. Or it's the, um, you know, or his about wife, the, the Dairy Jesus? Queen. <laughs> that's right. Yeah. <laughs> Do you know the Touchdown Jesus? Uh, on I 71, I 71, north of Cincinnati, someone built a huge, huge statue of jesus out of polymer coming out of a lake uh and it's it, it just 
uh, and it, so it became this thing because he's he's raising his arm, uh, and, and so it's people called it the touchdown Jesus. Uh, but then, in an absolutely surreal, surreal twist of fate, it was struck by lightning, and whatever plastic uh, mold they made out made it out of uh, turns out to be highly flammable, and so it erupted in a effigy like of, of punished idolaters, like cursed by the heavens, um, and it burned to burned to ashes and left nothing but rebar. Um, and seems really? like that was planned too. Yeah, it's a crazy story. Does anything remain there in that place now or nothing? I don't know if they rebuilt it. I don't know. Oh. Um, well, I really remember. Do you remember the graffito in Cincinnati? I don't remember if it's on 75, but Chris Sabo died for our sins. Was a graffito heading into downtown Cincinnati on the highway. Chris Sabo was a baseball player in Cincinnati. I never saw that. He got caught with a corked bat, but he was a good player. Uh, yeah. And uh, it was up. Maybe it's still there. And then the Hell is Real billboards. I don't know if you. Remember. Yeah, the Hell is Real. Yeah, I saw Chris Sabo. Um, and then I do actually have to go, unfortunately. But I'll leave our listeners with this. Um, uh, I went to a Cincinnati Reds baseball game that was. Uh, it, it rained, and I think it lasted 10 innings, uh, and it was before we got good this season, uh, and I was with my girlfriend who had never been to a baseball game, and my mom, and we wanted to stick it out, so we ended up like one of like 50 people in this cavernous empty stadium, um, and this guy, Chris Safo, who played for the Reds in the early 1990s, uh, his daughter did a video of like, hey, raise money for like some kind of Reds foundation. And Cincinnati is such a baseball town that Chris Sabo's daughter on a video in an empty stadium produced like a very like loud, rousing, audible cheer. Um, perhaps also because she's really beautiful. Uh, but I thought that was a really endearing fact about Cincinnati that we care enough about this random, not that good baseball player that his daughter has produced it. I hope we keep that. Um, well, Andy and Katora, thank you for your patience and your forbearance while James and I talked about Ohio uh, uh, today <laughs> in this sort of unplanned, but at least to me, interesting conversation. I guess we can keep going after James leaves. I do have to say that, you know, for the first time more than a decade, our Cincinnati Reds are in contention. Uh, and with a team full of rookies, it's been quite the year. Quite the year. Um, <clears throat> everyone, everyone, give them a give them a wish. We need we need all the support we can get. Yeah, I think a Reds Orioles World Series would just be the most glorious thing. <laughs> Five people would watch it, but they would and all uh, and all the executives of Major League Baseball would cry themselves to sleep every exactly. night. <laughs> um. All right, I have to go buy some spark plugs. Uh, and try to fix my engine. Um, so I hope you guys carry on and have a lot of fun. It's always fun talking to all of you. All right. Farewell, James. Write your book. So, uh, Katora and Andy, if if I would um, just stick around just for a minute, James and I talked about Ohio a lot. I want to give the floor to you, either for final thoughts or just thoughts. Um, and then we can, I don't know, wrap up. Oh, um about cool. what yeah, i don't know I don't, what we've talked about anything uh, you know yeah oh, i don't yeah. know i don't i don't know what all to what all to say um i guess i i uh i i i struggle with the, with the with free form sometimes i'm i'm also i'm also still working so i'm in the brain mindset of i have a specific purpose or task and now i don't i i'm distracted um but yeah, I don't know Ohio. I don't know much about it. I've been Andy, in and did out we of Ohio. persuade you at all about literature? Oh, people have been working on me about that for my whole life. Um, <laughs> there, there's there. I don't know. I, I it's. I almost wonder if I'm like a little like uh, uh, on the spectrum or something. It's so difficult for me to to really lean into novels. I mean, I can, I can do it. I've done it. I've read it. I've read a few of them. Um, but it gets challenging for me 
for some reason. And I don't know. It's and it's the same with movies. I, I can't follow a movie very well. I I'm bewildered by most movies. And people are sitting there laughing and clapping and saying, Wow, I can't believe this. I say, Who are who is this guy? I don't know who this guy is, you know? <laughs> so I don't know. It's that's just me. It's a me thing, you know. Is it Donald and I that convinced you to read um uh growth of the soil? Oh, growth of the soil is great. Yeah. I think it was Donald and me that convinced you to read that, right? I think it probably was. I, I can't remember <laughs> having heard of that book before you guys talked about it. What did you think? And of I it? did read it and I did find it excellent. There's no question. Yeah. Okay, so let's end with Growth of the Soil. That's something that all of us have, we've all shared reading and enjoying that. Katora, <laughs> what do you make? It's a really masculine novel, I think. Oh, I, but it's it's written so beautifully that you, you forget that it's masculine. <laughs> ah! <laughs> so what did, you do, what did you think of it? I loved it. I, I, I love stories that have, like, an arch of like forgiveness and repentance and shows beautiful parts of life, but also shows the ugly parts of life, but still lives, leaves you with this place of like hope and beauty. Um, I actually have a book that is the feminine version of. So let me find it really quick. Show it off. Oh. I have a guess of what this book's going to be. I've already showed you probably. Kristen Lobren's daughter. Oh, I've started reading that book. Just today, for the first time. I just, not today, a couple days ago. I just, I just started reading Chris, Chris and Lavin's Daughter. No, but the book that is like, this book here is, it's written in, it's kind of like a free form poet, um, poem, like a ballad or something. But it's, here's the cover. The Dark Knight by Mae Sinclair. And it's about this woman who falls in love with this man beautiful and it's like this the first bit, bit bit is this beautiful really beautiful romance and then uh they have a happy marriage for a little bit and then he falls out of love with her and falls in love with someone else and then it's this really dark kind of gets dark for a bit and really sad and depressing and then forget if the child is his with the other woman or something anyway something happens where she ends up taking this child Anyways, it ends with this really like surprising ending. It's a very redemptive ending that you would not see in most books at all. And it's all poetry, like and it it reminded me so much of um probably because I read them back to back by accident. Like I read Growth of Swell first and then I read this. And there were just so many similarities between the two. Um just with like, well, you know, like in Growth of the Soil, the man's wife kills her child and then she's sent to prison for a while but almost her greatest crime wasn't even so much of that as when she came back and her personality was just like completely changed and she just did not she wasn't the farm wife anymore she was like this woman who like was completely changed emotionally and philosophically in, in so many ways and so like that the way that man dealt with his wife in that scenario and then the way this woman deals with her husband in this scenario are very similar and unusual ways of like just seeing the other person in their humanity and, and like realizing that you're going through this like painful, like part or, like this painful transition. Cause you're being betrayed. But at the same time, I don't know. I just found it's the, both the books so beautiful because of how they portrayed forgiveness. They're, mm. they're great. But this book is really hard to find. It cost me like, I found, I, I felt like I was lucky. I found a copy for $20 and most of the copies online are like 60 to 80. So <laughs> they're hard to find, but it's a beautiful story. Yeah, I just rambled on. It was good. No. Do yeah. you two know the poet Robinson Jeffers? Yeah. yeah I have. I like... So Robinson Jeffers lived in Northern California, and he writes beautiful poems about Northern California. But my favorite thing about Robinson Jeffers is that he built a stone tower on his land, low, overlooking the the ocean. Like he lives by Big Sur, I think. 
And he writes the stone power appears in his poems a lot. Hmm. Um, and uh, so Andy, what? Yeah, do you read this poetry? Re- ring truer to you than than novels it does yeah it certainly does i like poetry a lot I, there's a lot of morbidly sophomoric poetry and wading through it is a chore but i find it to be worthwhile to to wade through all the crappy poetry that's out there to find the good stuff uh, i like that because it gets right to the heart of things you know, and I like that. That's how I am. I, I, I don't, I, I have a hard time taking the long route. You know, if I want to learn something, I go there or I, or I find the encyclopedia entry, or if it can't be encyclopedia chronicles, I like the poet, the, the poetic, the poetic angle, because it just gets right in there, you know? Um, and I, I enjoy that a, a great deal. And there's a lot of local poets in the Adirondacks that I like looking through and they're and they're pretty good um so yeah i like that sort of thing robinson jeffers was good because i read robinson jeffers when i was actually in california so the land that produced his his uh particular way of thinking to to read poetry where it was conceived of i think is is uh it really even heightens it you know so with um with your permission to view, maybe could I could we close by reading a Robinson Jeffers poem? Would that be all right? You have one on hand? Yeah, I do. Oh great. Um unless either of you have anything you want to say before that. I would just say that people should make sure to watch the video version too of this because then they will see Andy drinking out of his jug and smoking his pipe and they'll see <laughs> James Dog. <laughs> He turned the camera for a moment and like gave the dog a, a bit of a moment in the spot spotlight. People love that. Yeah, James's dog looked real happy. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Okay. Um. So this poem by Robinson Jeffers is called Pearl Harbor, and this poem got Jeffers in a whole lot of trouble because he opposed America's entrance into World War II, which. Um, was not a popular view after Pearl Harbor, as you can imagine. So this is Pearl Harbor by Robinson Jeffers. Here are the fireworks, the men who conspired and labored to embroil this republic in the wreck of Europe have got their bargain, and a bushel more. As for me, what can I do but fly the national flag from the top of the tower? America is neither race nor religion nor its own language nation or nothing stare little tower confidently across the pacific the flag on your head i built you at the other war's end and the sick peace i based you on living rock granite on granite i said look you gray stones civilization is sick stand a while and be quiet and drink the sea wind you will survive civilization but now I am old, and O oh, stones be modest. Look, little tower, this dust blowing is only the British Empire. These torn leaves flying are only Europe. The wind is the plane propellers, the smoke is Tokyo. The child with the butchered throat was too young to be named. Look no farther ahead. The war that we have carefully for years provoked catches us unprepared, amazed, and indignant. Our warships are shot like sitting ducks and our planes like nest birds. Both our coasts ridiculously panicked and our leaders make orations. This is the people that hopes to impose on the whole planetary world an American peace. A will not lose our war. My money on amazed Gulliver and his horse pistols. Meanwhile, our prudent officers have cleared the coast long ocean of ships and fishing craft, the sky of plains, the windows of light. These clearings make great beauty. Watch the wide sea. There's nothing human. Its gulls have it. Watch the wide sky. All day clean of machines. Only at dawn and dusk one military hawk passes high on patrol. Walk at night in the blackout. The firefly lights that used to line the long shore 
are all struck dumb. Shut are the shops, mouse dark the houses. Here the pre-human dignity of night stands as it was before and will be again. O beautiful darkness and silence, the two eyes that see God, great staring eyes.